Uh, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I pray this morning that your word would do what your word alone can do, Father. Would it penetrate soul and spirit, joint and marrow? Let it judge the thoughts and intentions of our heart. And Father, I pray that we would draw closer to the heart of Jesus as we look at your word together today, Father, in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen, amen. Uh, if you've got a Bible there, you can open really quickly to Luke chapter 17. We're going to start here. Um, before I, I go there, I'm going to ask you a question. Can anyone tell me the name of Lot's wife? Anyone tell me the name of Lot's wife? Call the name out for me. Potiphar? Did you say? Yeah? Uh, no, but, 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 good. Uh, hey, hands up. Guts for having a guess. Well done. Well done. Now, I'm going to, yes? No more. No more, yeah? That could be a, a Hebrew word for how she ended up, perhaps, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you all some time. We don't know the name of Lot's wife because we're never told Lot's wife's name. Okay, there you go. So there's the short answer. But we are told something about Lot's wife. In Luke chapter 17, verse 32, here's what Jesus tells us about Lot's wife. Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. I don't know what her name is, so I can't tell you, but I'm just telling you that this is what Jesus said to a bunch of people, and the Holy Spirit recorded it, that somehow Jesus is speaking to us in 2024, and his words to us are very simply saying, I want you to remember Lot's wife. There's only two passages that actually speak about Lot's wife in the Bible, but we've only got one specific action that Lot's wife did. So when we're remembering Lot's wife, there's only one thing that we're actually able to remember Lot's wife for. And that was her fatal flaw. She looked back when she should have been moving forward. Remember the story? She's coming out of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and the Lord says, walk, and the angels are walking and he's going to burn the city and she looks back. And when she looks back, what happens? She turns into a pillar of crushed black pepper. Salt. It was actually salt. I just don't like salt. She turns to a pillar of salt. So she looks back when she should have been moving forward and it literally cost her her life. And here's the truth. For many believers, looking back is still costing us parts of our life too. It might not cost us our physical life, but it's stopping us from enjoying the abundant life that God offers to us. God was trying to take her out of a place and walk her forward into a place that was going to be good. Why was it good? Because God was taking her there and God only takes us to good places. Amen. God was leading her into a better place than the place she was coming out of, but she made the fatal mistake of looking over her shoulder. Now, I don't know. Some people might feel like, God, that's a bit harsh, God, you know? And, and maybe it was. I mean, I'm sure that I've looked back on my life and, praise God, I've never turned into a pillar of salt. Not yet. I'm not expecting it. I hope it doesn't happen. But that's what happened. And that's the only thing we know about Lot's wife. And so Jesus says to us, I want you to remember Lot's wife. So the only thing we have to remember her about is here's a picture of a person who was being led one way by God, decided to look back at what they were leaving, and that was the end of their life. And whilst we may not physically lose our life, I do believe as Christians that God is calling us forward to follow him and to go to places. And many of us have a tendency, there are things in our past behind us that we keep turning around and we keep looking at. And whilst it might not cost us our life physically, it's certainly going to cost us in other ways. Because we're looking back here at things in the past that Jesus is saying, leave them behind, stop looking at them, let them go. This is also the very lesson that Jesus was giving when he talked about this. If we look at the broader context, Luke 17, verse 30 to 33, he says, It'll be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, the one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should, go to, should not go down and get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. In other words, you're, you're moving forward in life, you're doing something, and he's saying when the Son of Man comes, don't, don't go back to those things. Don't, don't feel like you're going to go back into the past and take that stuff with you. You've got to let some of that stuff go. He says this in the very next verse. He says, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. So in other words, here's what he's saying. He's saying there's something about looking back that's an aspect of trying to preserve a part of your life that God's saying, I want you to let go of it. I want you to lose it. I want you to leave that behind. I don't want that to be a part. What's back there is not, all, not everything back there is meant to be a part of up here. Now, that doesn't mean that we forget everything and we don't remember things. Some things are too hard to forget. Some things are too nice to want to forget. 
It's not about forgetting, but it's about choosing not to remember. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference between totally forgetting or choosing not to remember. And what he's saying here is there are some things in your past, you've got to choose not to remember those things. You might not be able to forget them, but you've got to choose not to remember. Stop looking over your shoulder. Stop being tied back, being held back, being dragged back. Because what it's doing is it might not be taking your life physically, but it's certainly holding you back from experiencing the abundant life that Jesus came to give us and that God calls us to. In Luke 9, verse 62, Jesus says this. He says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Some translations actually say it's fit for the kingdom. What, what, that, what that word actually means in the Greek, it means that you're not well-placed or useful. So Jesus is not saying you can't be saved if you hold on to the past, but that you'll be hindered. You'll be not well-placed in your attempts to follow him into the future that he has for you. How many of you want to follow Jesus into the future that he has for you? I want to, I want to walk forward every day. I love what Brandon said. I, 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 I want to look at my relationship with God, the one thing. Remember, we've been talking about Paul in Philippians says, oh, I'm chasing after this one thing. And this one thing is relationship with Christ. This one thing is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. I want to know him. I want to experience God. I want that to be my one thing. But he says, as I'm chasing after that one thing, I've got to let go of some other things to get that one thing, to reach forward to that one thing. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. What's the goal? To know him. He says, I haven't arrived there yet. I love the humility of Paul. Hey, I've been doing this for a long time, but I still haven't got there yet. Who's got there? Hands up if you got there. Hands up if you haven't. Some of us are still working out. You think you might or you might not. I'm not sure. I don't think any of us have got there just yet. He says, not that I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on. I'm pressing on to take a hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. In other words, Christ Jesus invaded my world one day, took a hold of me for a reason and a purpose. And I'm pressing on because I want that. I want to go after that. I want to experience what he saved me for. I, I want to know him because when I know him, everything else just falls in. The more I get to know him, the more that everything else kind of finds its place and just ends up in the right slot in my life. People, people get, get pressured about the will of God for their life. What's the will of God for my life? And we paralyze ourselves in fear of making a mistake. Here's the thing. If you're just getting to know him, you don't need to worry about what the will of God is for your life because the closer you get to him, he'll be leading you into that. And you'll wake up one day and go, gee, what a gr- this has been an awesome life, God. You've, you've, you've blessed me. You've used me in amazing ways. And it was not even maybe part of my 10-year plan. My 10-year plan is I just want to know you better in 10 years than I know you now. My one-week plan is to know you better at the end of the week than I do now. Because if I'm following you, this is the whole idea of following. If I'm actually following, then whatever. if I'm looking at him, no matter where he's going, I'm going there too. So I'm going to end up in the right place if I make following him the one thing. This is what Paul's passionate about, saying, following him. And he says, this is what I do. He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But here's the thing, but one thing I do. He says this, forgetting what's behind. I don't want to be like Lot's wife. I learned a lesson. Jesus, Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. And so I did, I remembered her, and I remembered what her fatal flaw was. She was looking back at things she shouldn't have been looking back at. And it hindered her going forward, and it cost her. She said, so I've learned something here. I want all you people to know. I'm writing this letter to her. I want all you people to know of all the things, the raising of the dead, the preaching of the gospel, the planning of the churches, all the amazing miracles I've seen, all the amazing things I've done in my life. By this stage, I think this is 27 years. Paul writes this letter around 27 years after his conversion experience. So 27 years of amazing things. But he says, you know what? If I could sum it all up and you put a gun to my head and said, you've only got time to give me one thing, what would you give me? He said, I'll tell you this one thing. Forget the past. Forget it. There are some things you're going to stop looking at. If you're going to press forward, you've got to stop looking back. Because if you're looking back and trying to run forward, you're going to trip over. If you're looking back and you're trying to run forward, you're going to bump into somebody and hurt them. If you're looking back and you're trying to run forward, you're going to lose your direction. You're going to lose your way. You're not even going to know where you're going. You could be, that's your goal, but you're running over here because you're looking over there and you think you're hitting that, but you're not because you're looking in the wrong direction. You've got to start looking forward. You've got to start looking forward. 
But one thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize, which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So what are some of the things that we need to forget in order to run forward? Today I want to talk about one thing, and over the coming weeks let's unpack a few different things. Throw some thoughts out of you. Let's just see if any of this lands with you. The first thing that I think we need to forget is we need to forget our past sins. Amen? We need to forget our past sins. How many of you have ever committed a sin in the past? How many of you committed a sin in the past, say, you did something 10 years ago? How many of you did something about a week ago? How many of you reckon you might have committed a sin in the past day? Zachy, stop pointing at me. I said up, not out. <laughs> in order to move forward, we've got to forget past sins. There are a lot of believers that are being held back by things they've done in the past. Sins they've committed, ways that they know they've fallen short of the mark of God. And we're still dealing today with the residue of that, the guilt of some of those things. We're still questioning. Am I really forgiven? Some of us are dealing with insecurity because of that. Inferiority, regret, shame because of some of that stuff. Some of us might even be living in fear that maybe some of that stuff's going to come to catch up with me now. And what does that mean? I can imagine Paul, as he writes this letter, being reminded by his own conscience and maybe even being reminded by the devil of the sins that he'd committed. Keep in mind, Paul wasn't always Paul. He was a guy called Saul. Saul wasn't a good guy. I think Saul's heart might have been good, but his actions were not good towards God's people, the church, the body. One thing I know about Jesus from reading the New Testament is that God takes it personal when people go after his kids. And Saul was going hard after his kids, wasn't he? He was taking uh, men and women and children and imprisoning them. And they were being fed to the lions and killed and all kinds of different things. This is the kind of man that he was. And now here he is now, 27 years after his conversion experience, in prison. He's writing this letter from prison. He's in prison because of that very gospel. And he's writing this letter to the churches and he's building them up and encouraging them and so on. And I wonder, I wonder whether as he's penning this letter in the back of his mind, he's still got that little pang maybe. He's still got that thought, hey, who do you think you are? You tried to kill these people. You, you tried to destroy this movement. Do you really think God forgives you? You really think God would forgive you? Look at what you did. I remember being on a boat in the Solomon Islands one time, coming back uh, from one island to another, was, was leading an outreach team over there. And a young guy in our outreach team got talking to a, a, a young man in the islands. And uh, this is just after the Civil War broke out in the Solomon Islands. And I used to get in and out of the islands all the time. And I can tell you, the nation changed after that war. I used to go in there and they were the happiest people on planet Earth, walking around smiling. And then after the Civil War broke out, we, we went back in there and all of a sudden people would walk downtown and instead of smiling, and at it, they'd walk past someone and they'd look the whole way. Because everybody did some horrible things during that time. And everybody was waiting for retribution. I might have killed your uncle or your auntie or burned down your house or something and I didn't know it, but you know it. And as soon as I get past you, you're going to turn around and it's going to be payback. Totally different nation. And we're on this boat and we're coming across uh, the bay there. And this young man starts talking to this, this guy who would have been no more than 19, 20 years of age. And he's sharing about the love and the grace and the compassion of Jesus and the forgiveness of Jesus to this man. And, and, and this guy's looking at him, taking in this message, but he's saying, but no, he can't forgive me. And this guy's going, no, he can. Here's what Jesus did on the cross. This is the power of the blood of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus. He can forgive all sins and so And the guy's going, no, you can't. And he's going, yes, he can, and he's pleading with him more. And in the end, the guy held his hands up with tears in his eyes and said, he cannot forgive me. I have blood on my hands. And during that civil war, he had taken life, literally. And this young man just proceeded to try to say to him, no, it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus can forgive you. This young man couldn't buy it, couldn't believe it. How could God forgive that? I mean, look, if I told a fib to you, yeah, God could have feared that, you know? A little white lie, I stole a pen from work. Who hasn't done that? <laughs> it's still theft. But God can forgive that. But God couldn't forgive this. How could God forgive a sin that big? 
So we, do, we have this hierarchy of sins, don't we? We tend to think that certain things are easier for God to forgive and others are harder for God to give. Like God's got to get the strength up to forgive that, but this one's a, a walk in the park. Now, the sacrifice of Christ, uh, Jesus died on a cross as a sacrifice for all sins across all time, no matter how big or small we think they are. Every single one of them was big enough to put a man on the cross. Every single one of them. James says, you break one law, you've broken them all. There's no hierarchy of sins. Different consequences, maybe, yes. But there's no hierarchy of what's better and what's worse. See, the truth is this, that God can forgive and God does forgive. The question is, can we also forgive ourselves? Can we let it go? And do we have the capacity to forget what's behind us? Or do we allow some of that stuff to still dig its claws into us? We put on a smiley face, we pretend like it doesn't matter, but deep down inside we know there's something that's keeping us from enjoying the fullness of God right now. There's something stopping me from really entering boldly to the throne of grace today. And that something is something that's back there in my past that's been dealt with by the blood of Jesus. He forgives me, but do I really believe that? Do I have the capacity to stop looking back at it, to stop allowing it to hold me back? Well, I couldn't take, I couldn't do that because of that. I won't tell you I'm, I'm saying no because of that, I'm, but I know why I'm saying no. I'm saying, I know why I'm not, not saying yes to these invitations of God. I know why I'm not coming boldly. I know why I'm not reading my Bible. I know why I don't spend time. And, and, and some of it is wrapped up in this stuff back there, and I'm looking at me back there, still thinking that's me today, and it's holding me back. And this Christian thing, to be, if I'm brutally honest with you, is a bit of a drudgery. Because I see Jesus saying, hey, thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came to give you life abundantly, but I just can't experience it. And it's not that it's not there. It's right there. It's that we won't allow ourselves to experience it because we feel like we've got to do some kind of penance for past sins. Remember in the Old Testament, you'd sin, they'd kill an animal, spill the blood. And then they'd walk away and say, hey, I'll see you later, mate. I'll see you next year because I know I'm going to sin again, so I've already got this one in the calendar. We'll be back. They kept coming back and kept sacrificing, kept spilling blood. And sometimes, even today, we feel like we've got to still keep spilling our own version of blood in order to get God's forgiveness. We've got our own rituals and our own penances and our own things that we do, our own ways. And maybe carrying guilt is a, a form of penance. If I just stay guilty enough, then I'll convince God that I really do agree with him. No, well, you're not agreeing with him because he says you're forgiven. So by hanging on to that stuff, you're actually not agreeing with God. You're agreeing with the devil. Jesus dealt with that. And he forgave us once for all. This was one of the battles that was faced by the young man in the parable that Jesus told called the prodigal son in, in Luke 15, verse 18 to 19. We, we, we've got this prodigal son who's living with his father, says, give me my inheritance. We all know the story. He goes off, spends it, wastes it. And then while he's sitting there feeding pigs, he says to himself, what am I doing? I'm going to go back home and, and say to my father that, you know, I've, I've sinned against heaven and against you and so on. So he, he, here's what happens is, is this is a picture of a man that repented not when he got home and stood in front of his dad. He repented the minute he put down the pig food and stood up and turned his back and started walking. Repentance is an action. It's not a word. Repentance is a lifestyle. It's what we do. It's how we live. Repentance is not a prayer. I can say I'm sorry but then stand there and play with the muck again. And then tomorrow I say, I'm sorry, I believe God can, can forgive, but I can stand there and play with the muck again. But don't call it repentance. It's not repentance. Repentance is not a prayer saying sorry. Repentance is an action where we turn and start walking away. And the minute this young man got up and started walking away, that was his act of repentance. And the father knows he'd repented. But watch what happens. Even though this guy is genuinely repented, here's what he says. He says, I'm going to set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy. I've repented. I've repented, but I am now no longer. I'm no longer. No longer. It's not like just for a temporary season, but I'm no longer. What I did back there has so scarred me and so impacted your image of me, God, that I no longer. I no longer. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he genuinely repented, but because of his indiscretions, the son thought that he had the right to come home, but also thought he had the right to tell the father how he should now treat him. I've done the wrong thing, and I know that I brought shame to your name, so from now on you need to see me as a servant, no longer as a son. The problem here was not with how the father now saw him, but it was how he saw himself. Because we go on with the story, and what does the father do? He doesn't hold him back. Even though he brought great shame to the father within the culture and the context of the story, I don't want to go into it now, but if you go back and you have a look at the shame that was brought upon the father, the things the father could have done before the son even walked away, there were a lot of things he could have done. But he just simply said, go, be free, that's what you want to do. 
He brought so much shame to the father. The father was shamed not just by the act of the son, but the father was even brought great shame within the community. The community around seeing what that father did, that, that would have brought shame on him to let the kid go. So you've got a father here that's copped not only the shame of the son walking away, but the shame of the community for the way he handled it. That's the amazing beauty of God's grace, isn't it? It's the beauty of grace and forgiveness. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. I'm not having a bar of this, you're no longer my son business. I'm not having a bar of that. You don't come to me and then you determine the level of how I see you. You don't come to me and go, look, my sin was really, really big, so just give me a month to outwork before you love me again fully, before you embrace me as a loving father and as your son. You, we don't do that negotiation with God. He doesn't love us because of our, our decisions or our opinions. He loves us because of his free will choice. He says, grab the robe, put it on him, put a ring on his finger, put sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf and kill it, let's have a party and celebrate. The son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found, so they began to celebrate. So he wanted to be a servant, and the father said, no way, you're a son. And, and by putting the robe and the ring and the sandals on him, what was the father doing? He was separating him, distinguishing him from the servants. Because the servants didn't have rings, and the servants didn't get robes, and the servants didn't get sandals. And the father didn't say, well, hang on a second, I'm just going to give you a ring, but I'm going to make sure there's enough of a mark there to distinguish you as a sinner from the rest of the saints. He didn't do that. He didn't say, okay, I'll just give you maybe the sandals. But I'm not going to give you the other two, because I just want everyone to know that you're a bit of a scarlet man now. You've got a history. You've done the wrong thing. You've sinned. You're not as perfect as you once were. That's not what he does. He says, I'm going to give you a ring and a robe and sandals and you are restored straight back to where you were as if you'd never done that thing in the first place. As if you'd never done that thing in the first place. But here's the son going, but I don't deserve that and I don't want to walk in that and I don't want to receive that. See, it was had nothing to do with the father. It had everything to do with the son. Amen? It had everything to do with the son had everything to do with the son and how he saw himself. He may have felt like a servant. He might have even felt like a servant, but he wasn't. He was actually a son. And maybe you feel like a, 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 a sinner that's saved by grace, but kind of you're back here and you can't fully embrace God. You can't fully get involved in the party of life. You can't fully enjoy forgiveness and freedom. You can't fully come bold. Like maybe you're thinking that's for other people. Can, Margaret Burgon can do that because she's holy and pure and, you know, got it all together and prays and reads the word. And maybe Jackie can and, you know, maybe... Other people can, but not quite sure that it's me because I've still got a bit of stuff here. But we don't understand the love and the grace of God. We don't understand the love and the grace of God. So he was not only forgiven, but he was also restored, which is what the gospel message is. The gospel message is not just about forgiveness. It's about restoration. Jesus didn't just die to, to forgive your sins. Forgiving your sins was part of the process of redeeming your entire being, buying you back. Buying you back. Sin has never been the focus of God. John 3.16 does not say, for God so hated sin that he sent his only son. He says, for God so loved the world. The focus of the gospel has never been sin. It's always been people. It's never been all the bad, evil things happening in the world. It's been God's incredible heart and love for humanity that God has gone over and above to set us free, to buy us back, to redeem us, to show us our value, to show us our worth. Now it's up to us to believe it and embrace it and walk in it. And, and for some of us, we'll never be able to do that as long as we're holding on to this, the, the sins of the past and we still think that those sins of the past have the power to separate us from God, even if it's just by a shadow. We'll never enjoy the fullness of a relationship with God. He was restored, which is actually what the gospel message is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Then he goes on in verse 4 and 5 and says, But because of his great love for you, because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. He made us alive with Christ. You didn't make yourself alive. He made you alive in Christ by his own free will choice. He made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. When you were dead, he made you alive. Think about that. You went from total dead to total alive like that because he did it. There was no uh, a journey of dead to life. 
of proving I'm worthy to be given life, Lord Jesus. Let me prove it to you. No, he just chose by his own free will. While you were a sinner, while you were a transgressor, he made you alive. You did not make yourself alive. God did it. This is the grace and the power of Jesus. This is the one Paul says, he's my one thing. I just want him. I just want to go after him. I just want to know him. We didn't make ourselves alive by our confession of sin. God made you alive because of your confession of Christ. God brought you to life. You didn't slowly progress from death to life as you got your life cleaned up. You went from death to life the moment you put your faith in Christ and started following him. We've been made alive by the free will choice of the Father, not by our own efforts. He made us alive. I love what Brennan Manning says, one of my favorite quotes. Uh, 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 He's passed away now, a priest. He said this, God loves us as we are and not as we should be, for none of us are as we should be. God was not waiting for us to be who we should be before he decided to fully love us. Nor should we wait to be who we think we should be before we choose to accept and believe that we are loved. Believe that we are forgiven. There's a, a song by a guy called Toby Keith. Any country music fans here? A guy called Toby Keith. Anyone listen to Talk and Sport? On the radio? Yep. The theme song was this Toby Keith song, and, and, and the, the name of the song was, I Ain't As Good As I Once Was. Any man resonate with that one this morning? I Ain't As Good As I Once Was, you know? And it goes on through all these scenarios of life. Yeah, once upon a time, I could have, you know, but nowadays I'm a bit, no, I can't, you know. I ain't as good as I once was, but I once was brilliant. The older I get, the better I was, they say. This song says, I ain't as good as I once was, but the truth is some of us ain't as good as we think we are now. That's the truth. Some of us ain't as good as we think we are now. Maybe if I compare myself to, you know, to Patrick, maybe I might feel, maybe, I don't know. Maybe, well, not to Bevan, he's much more holy. Um, who's a sinner over here I can pick on? Owen's away, so. Luke 22, Jesus has this conversation with Peter. Now, Peter thought he was pretty good. In the moment, Peter thought, now I've got this thing. Peter's not struggling from his past sins holding him back. Peter's thinking, I've nailed it, I'm pretty good. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. This is the disciples. But then he says this, but I've prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, Wow. Simon, Simon, I'm praying for you that your faith won't fail. But when you turn back, in other words, I'm praying your faith won't fail, you're going to fall. I already know you are going to fall. But here's what I'm going to tell you in advance. You're going to fall, but I've still got a call in your life and a purpose and a plan for your life, even though I know you're going to fall. Even though I know. He says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. (laughs) We've got the beauty of hindsight, Pete fail. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you're going to deny me three times. You're going to deny the fact that you know me. So here's the point. In other words, when you fall, Peter, if you listen very closely, you're going to hear me saying, get up, not get out. You're going to fall, Peter. You're going to fall. And when you fall, Peter, here's the thing. I want you to hear me saying, get up, not get out. And too many of us have fallen and we hear God say, get out. And so we stay at a distance. We stay outside the fence, looking in, watching everybody else enjoy the Christian life, moving forward, embracing forgiveness, embracing grace, believing God has a plan and a purpose for my life, but we can't do it because we're back here because we're still thinking of ourselves as the person that did that thing. We still think that thing has more power to hold us back than the grace and beauty of God has to launch us forward in life. And it's a lie from the pit of hell. It's a lie from the devil. The forgiveness of Christ was complete. He forgave you, he did the sacrifice, you don't and I don't. And we've got to believe that. See, God's not surprised by our humanity. He's not put put off by our humanity. Now, humanity doesn't change who God is. In fact, he understands it. And the Bible makes it very clear that God works within it. Hebrews chapter 4, the writer of Hebrews says this, 15 and 16. He says, we do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness. I want you to think about that. Don't brush over it. You do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who is unable to empathize with your weaknesses. Think about that. You do not have a high priest, a God, who cannot sympathize, empathize with your personal weaknesses, no matter what they are. Some of you have got this, some of you have got that. We've all got them. 
it, it goes on and it says, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Man, isn't that awesome? Jesus was tempted in every way. He did not sin. He did not give in, but we do, but he can empathize with us. Jeez, I wish, I wish more of us were like Jesus. If we, if we are strong enough to resist temptation and sin in an area, but somebody else fails, I wish that we would learn to be more like Jesus and still empathize with them. Instead, we go, why can't you beat that? I did. Why can't you just stop doing that? Because I, I don't do it. Why can't you be better? Because I'm better. I can't believe you struggle with that. I don't struggle with that. Can't you see that's a sin? Can't... Yet here's, here's one who was tempted in every way, beat every temptation, yet it says he can empathize with our weaknesses. That's a God who understands your humanity. So give yourself a little bit of grace, would you? Cut yourself a little bit of slack. Chase after him. Go after the one thing. But give yourself some grace. And one of the things you've got to do, one of the starting points to give yourself some grace today is I would encourage you, stop looking at that stuff that you've done in the past. You are now a new creation. Old things are gone. All things have become new. And some of us have got things back there and you're going, well, Alan, maybe you don't understand or I did this or I did that. Here's the deal. I don't need to know. Uh, if, you, if you feel you need to confess and talk about stuff, great. Grab someone, talk to somebody. But at the end of the day, as far as God is concerned, he's thrown that thing as far as the east is from the west. And he chooses not to remember it anymore. He chooses not to remember that stuff anymore. You may struggle, but he doesn't struggle. Because he paid a price for it 2,000 years ago. And when you put your faith in him, he decided that's gone. And he's saying to you, you've got to let it go too. You've got to let it go. Let us approach. Then he goes on and says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's a struggle for many people. And this is why we, we can't approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Because we don't believe in a God that empathizes with our weakness. We believe in a God that's just waiting to bring the hammer down on us if we come near him because we know. I'll oh, just stay away. If I get too close. That's not the nature of God. That is not the character and nature of our Heavenly Father. Get the news out to come back. I'm going to finish up. I took my second son, Jonathan, fishing one day. Jonathan was a rat bag. Anyone here that knows Jonathan, some of you may know Johnny, he was always the rat bag of the family, right? Still probably is. I remember taking him fishing one day with a young kid. Anyone know Elijah? Know Elijah Hickling? He's come along here. Young indigenous boy played. Yeah, him. Elijah and Johnny were like figure thieves when they were kids. Come around, they'd play worship stuff in our garage together and, and, and jam together and played footy together and touched together. And Anyway, one day, uh, Johnny said, Dad, would you take me fishing and can Elijah come? I said, yeah, no worries. So I took them fishing over uh, in, in West Ballina there where the, you know, where the bridge is that goes over West Ballina into town. I'm there on the jetty. There's a little jetty there at the time and we're fishing. And, but, but what I did say was um, uh, they didn't have fishing gear. So I gave them fishing gear that was my uh, fishing rods. And I, I love fishing, so I make sure my fishing stuff is of decent quality. And so I, I, I gave, I, I cast a rod out for Johnny, laid it up, cast it out, and I gave it to Johnny, and he's holding it. And I gave Johnny one instruction. Don't put the rod down. Just don't put it down. Because if you do and a fish grabs it, boom, I'm, I'm going to lose my rod. So Johnny, no, oh, no, you're on right, Dad. I'll hold it, I'll hold it, no worries. So I came over here, and I cast out Elijah's rod, and Elijah's rod sitting there, and I'm standing back here watching, and Elijah gets a fish. Bang, rod takes off, and he doesn't know what to do with it. So I come over to help him, and we pull it in. It's a big stingray. So I get my knife and I'm leaning down over the edge of the thing to, to, to cut the stingray loose. And as I did, I hear this voice just over my left shoulder and this voice was, oh, what is it, Dad? Look up. And there's Johnny standing there and I look over there. There's the fishing rod sitting on the edge of the jetty. No sooner did I look at the rod, the tip went chick, chick, boom, and took off and just boom, disappeared into the river. I was livid. I jumped up. I, I, I quickly cut the thing. I ran to the edge of the jetty. I didn't care. Cars, everything going around. It would have looked very, very bad. I ripped my pants off, my shirt off. I'm standing there in my underpants. I, I go to dive in the water because the rod's just on the surface of the water. And just as I'm ready to dive, the rod goes shh, woof, and disappeared into the dark water. Ah! I turned around. I said, Johnny, 
what have you done? I told you one thing, just don't let go of the rod. And I'm, and I'm getting quite angry and frustrated at him because it was a great rod, an expensive rod. Do you know what you've done, Johnny Baba? And I can see he starts to kind of quiver and he knows all of a sudden he realizes I've done something wrong here. And then my, my heart broke for him because I realized, oh, Alan, it's just a fishing rod. It's not a big deal, you know? Yeah, it costs some dollars, but that's your son. That's your son. And so he's kind of standing there with a quivering lip, and he said, Dad, I'm sorry. And I said to him, you know what, Johnny? I forgive you. I forgive you. And Johnny went, oh, good. Dad, can I use another rod? I went, what? Don't you understand what you've done? And I got into more of a like rage. And then while I'm trying hard not to explode a second time, the Holy Spirit said this to me. He said, what are you getting mad about? All he did is accept your grace. And then the Spirit of God said this to me. Why can't you accept mine? Alan, why can't you accept mine? And, and, and I would just leave you with that picture this morning. Why can't you just accept the grace of God? We repented. We apologized. We turned away. All Johnny did was showed me right there in that moment, this is what it looks like. He carried on forward. He went forward as if what happened back then didn't happen at all. Because when I said, I forgive you, he actually believed me. He actually believed me. Pretty wild. And that's a picture of you and me and God. Amen? It's a picture of you and me and God. God forgives us. My question this morning is, can you forgive yourself? Can you believe and trust God to walk forward into that forgiveness, into that grace? And go after that one thing. Let's all stand together this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus. I don't know everybody in this room. But can I just encourage you, if you do not know Jesus Christ, if you've never made a decision to follow after him, can I encourage you this morning that God is a good father and God loves you. God has good plans and purposes for your life. We're all sinners, and we're all in need of a saviour, and God provided one through Jesus 2,000 years ago. We're all saved by grace. It's the grace of God. It's the free will decision and choice of God to grant salvation to us, to set us free, to, to take away the shame, to take away the guilt. That's God's free will choice, but we have an action to play in that, and that is we make the decision to believe that what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, I was a part of the process. He did that for me. And I make the decision that from this point on, I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to start living for Jesus. I'm going to start following Jesus. Jesus going where he's taking me. That's what salvation is. I'm not going to live for myself anymore. I'm going to live for Jesus. If you're here and you've never made that decision, can I encourage you? You can do that right now where you are. You can say a simple prayer to God. You can open your heart. It can be verbal. It can just be internally. But you can make that decision right now to follow after Jesus. If you've got any questions about that, can I encourage you to grab somebody and talk to somebody today before you leave this building? Maybe there are some of us here this morning and you know, you know Jesus and you love Jesus and you know if you die tonight, you're going to be with him for eternity. But you also know that there's stuff in your past that's holding you back, that you, you're struggling to let go of. Stuff that makes you think that you're probably not as spiritual or as holy or as perfect as the person next to you. Or maybe the person that brought you or you came here with today. You feel like you're some kind of second-rate Christian. You're some kind of uh, 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 a used version of something. And you don't actually believe that when you came to faith, Jesus said, I've made all things new. And you became a new creation. If that's you this morning, I want to ask you to do one of a couple of things. I want you to just take some time and just sit with the Lord this morning. Ask God to show you that you actually are forgiven. Ask God to take away those feelings of guilt and so on. Make a commitment to the Lord this morning. I'm no longer going to look back at that. And every time those thoughts pop into my head and every time I feel that way or I hear a voice say that I'm attached to that and because of that, you're this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to acknowledge that is not you, God. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I might hear that voice, but I'm no longer going to respond to it. I'm no longer going to walk with it and live with it. Maybe this morning you need to grab somebody and say, hey, could you pray for me? Plenty of people in this room that know Jesus, and you know some of them. What you going to grab someone and say, hey, here's what I'm feeling this morning. Here's what I've recognized. Here's what God's showing me. Would you please pray for me? My, my prayer is that all of us in this room, we would let go of the stuff of the past. Why would we choose to remember that which God himself has chosen to forget? Why would we give power to control our life to something back in here that Jesus dealt with way before we even did it when he's saying, walk forward with me and let it go? Remember Lot's wife. Don't keep looking back. 
And if that's you this morning, then I'd love you to grab somebody, pray with one another. If, if you feel like you need to come up the front and uh, have somebody pray for you up here, we'd be more than happy to pray for you as well this morning. How about you guys just lead us in a song? I just want to pray for us. Father, I want to thank you for this morning. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. God, I want to thank you for life in Jesus. God, I want to thank you for freedom. God, we sang that song where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. But I know there are people here that are not experiencing that freedom. And God, maybe because there's stuff they've done in the past. But Lord, they can accept the fact that maybe you forgave them, but they certainly can't believe you've redeemed them. They know that their sins have perhaps been forgiven but they don't really believe that you've chosen to forget them. And that maybe, God, when you look at them, you're still seeing some of that stuff in the past and you're holding them back to that, Lord, when really they're just holding themselves back. So, Father, I pray for those people this morning. I pray that, God, you would do something supernatural and real in their world today. God, I pray that you would break those chains, you would break those uh, things that are holding people back today. God, I pray that light and truth would flood into those spaces and that, Lord, they would walk out of here with a spring in their step and they would know that they are a child of God. They are not a second-rate child of God, a third-rate child of God. They are a, a child of God that, Father, you've given them a ring and you've given them a robe and you've given them sandals this morning, Father, and you've separated them from those that are not your children. God, that they were dead in one moment and like that, you brought them back to life. That, Father, you are not holding the sins of our past against us and that you don't want us to hold the sins of our own past against ourselves either, Father. God, I pray that in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, you are the only one some of these, some of the, I believe there are people here and some of this stuff is so ingrained in your psyche. It's so ingrained in your psyche that you're going to, you, you might feel some emotional thing here and, and there's a glimmer of hope. But when you walk out the door, it's not going to take long before you resort back to thinking, yeah, well, we've moved on now, but I'm still living the same. I'm still thinking the same. And, 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 and I just, just encourage you this morning, pray before you walk out this door. Holy Spirit, I know the battle is real. Holy Spirit, I pray, would you come and would you break those thought patterns? Would you break those chains? Would you cut off those memories from me? When I think about that stuff, would it no longer have the hook that it has in me that's holding me back? Because God, we want to run with you, God. We want to be free. We want to experience our faith. We want to experience life to the full. We want to experience the abundant life that Jesus said he came to give us in John 10.10. 10. The thief has stolen, killed, and destroyed from too many people in the church for way too long now. And it's time that by faith we grab a hold of what God says and we start believing the right things and rejecting the wrong things. Because them wrong things are just holding us back from life. So, Father, we just commit this into your hands. And I pray for each person here this morning, Lord. Speak to their hearts. Prompt, lead, and guide us, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We're going to worship. If you need to leave, that's fine. Feel free. There's tea and coffee next door. Go grab yourself a tea, coffee, hang around, have a chat. If you'd like prayer, uh, up the front, please feel free to come up. If you want to grab somebody you're here with, you're comfortable, go and pray with them as well. Grab them, uh, do that. Let's be the church. Let's minister to one another this morning. If you want to stand there and worship, you want to come forward, just kneel and just be with God. If someone comes to pray, just say, no, I'm fine. I just want to be with the Lord. That's fine. That's fine. Bless you guys.